Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dick Sapp. I'm an attorney with the Nymaster Good Law Firm here in Des Moines. Uh, for many years, the Southern District of Iowa branch of the Historical Society of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals has conducted video and oral interview histories of our Southern District federal judges. And today I have the a great privilege to conduct the interview of my longtime friend and former law partner, the Honorable U.S. District Judge, now senior status, James Gritzner. Um, before getting into the specific questions I would like to ask his honor, uh, we can start by summarizing his, his professional career uh, at the peak of a very successful trial practice in private practice at Nymaster. He had the opportunity to become uh, an Article III judge. And uh, he was nominated by President George W. Bush on July 10 of 2001 and was confirmed by the U.S. Senate uh, on February 14 of 2002 and began his service on the federal bench on March 1 of 2002. He became chief judge of the Southern District uh, in, on November 1 of 2011 and he served in that role until he took senior status in 2015. He continues today in that senior status capacity and still hears cases here in the Southern District. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you for doing this. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I, I find it a rare, unprecedented opportunity to question a federal judge and uh, <laughs> make him answer my questions as to the other, as opposed to the other way around. And so. I'm, a tad, uh, <laughs> I'm a tad intimidated by being deposed by Dick Sapp. <laughs> uh, but anyway, thanks for doing this. I know you well enough to know that. The last thing you like to do is talk about yourself, <laughs> but I'm going to quietly insist and, and, and ask you to do that today. Um, let's start, uh, let's begin by starting at the beginning, I guess. Would you tell us about your early years, your family, where you were born and raised, and your uh, your growing up uh, before college? Well, I was an Iowan by birth. Uh, I was I was born in Charles City, but um, uh, the, the uh, WikiLeaks uh, page for uh, Charles City says I'm a notable uh, uh, person from Charles City. I was there for two days as an infant. Um, I, we actually lived in Plainfield, Iowa at that time. Uh, my dad ran a lumber yard uh, in Plainfield, uh, and I lived there until I was three years old, and then we moved to Minnesota where dad was gonna become the manager of a lumber yard there. Uh, which he managed until I was a senior in high school, and uh, and then uh, he ended up going back to Iowa and uh, getting involved with a, uh, an uncle of mine in a steel products business, and uh, that uh, turned out very well for him. But um, I did graduate from high school in uh, Spring Valley, Minnesota, uh, but um, uh, but we moved up there, and I, I grew up pretty much in uh, rural in Spring Valley, Minnesota, a small town of about uh, oh 2,500 to 3,000 people, uh, two of whom. Our federal judges, uh, uh, Judge Donovan Frank in St. Paul, and I grew up together. He would want you to know that I grew up first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very broad question, but I think appropriate. Any particular experiences in your childhood, uh, growing up, uh, uh, that uh, eventually, in your mind, as you reflect back, determined your career course and your career interests, or? Uh, you know, form some uh, uh, aspect of your character and, and beliefs that influenced your eventual well, practice that's a, uh, in law or on the bench? That's a really interesting question when, when you think about it. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure um, what may have had a substantial impact. You know, one of the things you learn in life is that there are a lot of very small incidents that end up completely changing the track of your life. And, um, and so sometimes trying to think of what those are is, is kind of a challenge. I had a very supportive childhood. I, I'd love to be able to uh, give you a gift to the history with great drama, but I don't have any of that. Uh, I had a very supportive family, uh, very terrific people, uh, hardworking. Um, you know, they were children of the Depression that came out of it, uh, working very hard. So I certainly gained a sense uh, for dedication to hard work, uh, a, a work ethic uh, that was something that you just observed in my family. Um, my dad um, <laughs> frequently, when I was a kid, would say, so uh, you think you're ever going to amount to anything? 
And it was it was just a funny thing that he would say at the time. But you know, it's amazing how that stuck with me all these years. Do you think he'll ever amount to anything? <laughs> And uh, it kind of uh, was taken as a challenge for me, but mostly it was just a, a very supportive uh, environment, a very nice town uh, to grow up in, uh, and um, uh, among uh, you know very nice people. It was a, a very safe place to grow up, and I think that had a lot to do with how you develop. Uh, it was always just assumed that I would go to college. I was never encouraged necessarily to do that. It was just something that was always assumed. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing that, that stands out as being very significant as I think back on it, um, the lumber company that my dad was with when I was a senior in high school uh, was sold to a larger group. And when that happened, they didn't need him. And so he was laid off. And uh, right at about that same time, I got this full ride scholarship to go to college for free. And when my dad got that news, it's the only time I ever saw this strong man with a tear in his eye because he just felt like he'd been rescued. Uh, and uh, it was a very short period of time and he, he got on his feet and, and uh, with uh, another opportunity that ended up being very good. But uh, uh, that was something that uh, in some respects at a very young age gave me a feeling that I, I paid a little back to somebody who had been so supportive for me. And we'll, we're going to come back to uh, your lovely wife, Zoe, a little bit further in this interview, but tell us about your, your present family, your, your wife and your son. Well, uh, Zoe and I have been together uh, since uh, before law school. We met uh, in the broadcasting business, which we'll probably talk about uh, a little later. And uh, uh, she was uh, uh, selling uh, commercials that fly through the air. Uh, and um, uh, I was uh, in the news business at the time, and that's where we met. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, the, the first time that we met, um, I was uh, on an assignment uh, trying to get uh, some work done. My camera crew that was with me knew her. And they wanted to stop and say hello, and I was uh, very irritated because I was in a hurry. And so her first impression of me was pretty lousy, uh, but uh, it gained a little better uh, as time went by. And uh, but uh, uh, we got married, and, and um, she has been very supportive of a lot of decisions that put her life in upheaval over the years. Right. Right. And uh, Zach, our son, is a graduate of Central College, uh, and um, he's a good, strong young man. Uh, he's uh, not uh, uh, given us any grandchildren yet, but uh, we keep encouraging <laughs> that. So uh, after your graduation from high school, I know you attended college at Dakota Wesleyan, uh, and as, I, uh, as you just mentioned, on full ride scholarship, which is impressive. Uh, uh, what, what, if any, career aspirations did you have as you look back, as you began College. Well, you know, <laughs> I went to college to be a choir director uh, and to study music, uh, and uh, so um, actually this this whole thing didn't work out because <laughs> I, I never made it through. Um, I, I got into uh, uh, music theory in college, and I thought, now wait a minute, this is really hard, and if I'm going to work that hard and work and study that hard, I think I'd like to make more money than being a choir director. <laughs> so uh, I ended up uh, moving away from music. It ended up being a minor, uh, ultimately, uh, from Dakota Wesleyan. But I, I ended up studying uh, in the speech department and the psychology department with a major in both speech and psychology. We may touch on this. Uh, and well, and I, I respond to the, uh, uh, the scholarship thing. That was, uh, uh, they had a group at the time called the Highlanders Quartet. And the, and the quartet toured for the college as part of the image of the college and, and uh, we did concerts and of course the, uh, the recruiting people would come along and talk to students in high schools and that sort of thing. And, um, but um, uh, to do that, um, we all four of us had a full ride scholarship uh, and of course you have to understand in those days the number that was a full ride scholarship wouldn't get you a dinner plan today. <laughs> well I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to bring that up. Uh, not only do you have a, an obviously great resonant speaking voice, but you're a talented singer, and that was the basis of your scholarship in, in college, correct? Well, at one time. I wouldn't pay to hear me sing today. <laughs> but uh, there, there was a time yeah. when it wasn't bad. And so, as you've stated, you, you started out as a music major, but you then switched to speech and psychology, which leads me to ask, on reflection, was that any hint of an interest in 
law at that stage? As it progressed, I got involved in intercollegiate debate and um, in the process of being a debater. Uh, and we, it went well for us. We did well. And, and uh, my debate partner, a fellow named Doug Hain, uh, Doug uh, was going to be a lawyer. And uh, he's the first person that ever said to me, you know, you really ought to go to law school. And that kind of planted the seed, and uh, it started generating from all of that. Um, Doug, of course, never did become a lawyer. He ended up with a PhD in literature, I think. Um, but, um, uh, but that planted the seed uh, that law school is probably what I wanted to do. Um, although when I graduated from college, uh, I just wasn't ready yet to go to law school, and I had gotten into some other things that kind of took me on a slightly different path for a while. And that other thing, as I understand it, was uh, the beginning of a possible career in broadcasting. It was. Can you tell us how that came about. It was. Well, I, I got involved in uh, broadcasting uh, while I was still in college. Uh, I was the MC for a homecoming event, and the local television and radio owner was in the audience. And he came up to me afterward and he said, Hey, kid, you got the gift of gab. Would you like to come and work for me? And uh, so I did, and I became a radio announcer and uh, then got into uh, news, and uh, uh, from that, um, the jobs just started getting a little better, and I ended up in uh, uh, Austin, Minnesota, on a television station there as an anchor man, and uh, then uh, uh, came back to Iowa uh, with uh, the Blackhawk Broadcasting Company, and uh, was in the news business uh, uh, for oh, seven or eight years, I guess, uh, before uh, I realized I needed to get back to law school. And you were doing on-air broadcasting, as I understand, as well as some documentary-type projects, is that? I was. Right? I, I, was uh, I was a reporter, uh, did political reporting, uh, and uh, was also on-air uh, as an anchor man from time to time. And, uh, and toward the end of that career, I got involved in uh, producing documentaries. Uh, for the company, and uh, uh, so we were, I was a little more behind the camera at that point, uh, but putting the programming together. So, uh, at that stage, it sounds like your potential broadcasting career was, was growing, perhaps. What, what was it, if one thing, that made you decide that you were going to change your career path and go to law school? Well, it was always there uh, in the back of my mind, and um, when you're in the news business, one of the things that you notice is that many of the people that are making the news are lawyers. So that kind of reinforced it over the years, uh, and uh, uh, so that was uh, partly a, a consideration as I continued into different jobs in broadcasting, thinking that that is still something that was in the back of my mind. And then uh, Zoe and I went to a New Year's Eve party, and somebody was talking at the party about a friend of theirs that had always wanted to go to law school and never went, and now he's uh, 75 years old and depressed because he just never did it. We went home that night and I said, Zoe, I gotta go. <laughs> I've gotta go now. And, uh, and she was very supportive of that, so we, we went to law school, and we ended up, we ended up going to Drake, and, and the reason we, uh, we chose Drake, in fact, I really didn't apply anywhere else, uh, is that I could uh, continue to do uh, broadcast work for public television in Des Moines while I was in law school. Uh, so it was a, a way to make a few bucks while I was going to law school. So the history can reflect that your decision to go to law school occurred at a New Year's Eve party. At a New Year's, I, I was sober, but, uh, but I, was, I was impressed by, by the idea that I, I might wait too long and, and then regret that I never did it. And you touched on this, but I think it's worth repeating as you've indicated. I know Zoe had a major role in all of your key decisions through your career. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and this was one of them. This was absolutely one of them, and, and she's, uh, she's been very supportive. She has been an absolute trooper. Uh, and uh, put up with a lot of interference in her life uh, in support of what I wanted to do. And uh, um, I appreciate that, uh, although uh, I probably don't say that to her as much as I should. And so to place this in, in the time frame, when you uh, made this decision and began your law school career, that we would be in 1976 at that point? Yeah, 76 is when I went to law school. Okay. I won't summarize all of your law school experience, but suffice it to say, you, you made it. <laughs> and, uh, 
and graduated. I do want to ask, though, I think it's fair, as I understand, in your senior year of law school, you had an opportunity to rise that had an influence. Tell us about that. Yeah, I had, um, I had an opportunity to uh, do a judicial internship with Judge Lawrence there. And um, uh, right after uh, I completed that project, uh, Judge Longstaff uh, uh, realized that he was in a position to hire a law clerk. And uh, so he called me up, and while I was still in my, well, actually, I guess it was the last year and a half of law school, uh, Judge Longstaff asked me if I would come to work as a law clerk for him. I had actually started law school in the summer, so I was a little ahead of the game, and I did have the ability to... Uh, reduce the hours at the law school and still graduate with my class uh, because I was a little bit ahead of it. Uh, and so Longstaff uh, said he would make it possible for me to still go to law school while I was working for him if I would give him a particular number of hours per week. And, uh, um, and so uh, once again, um, I, I told him at the time when he offered me the opportunity, I said, well, I, I need to go talk to Zoe. <laughs> And so I went out to the radio station here in town where Zoe was working at the time, and I said, okay, here's what happened. Judge Longstaff offered me this job as a law clerk while I'm still in law school, and um, what do you think? And Zoe said, well, you accept it, right? I said, well, no, I, I wanted to come and talk to you first. And she said, call him now and accept. <laughs> and you did. And I did. And I raise that at this point because I know, and we'll touch on this a little bit later as well, that became more than a mentor-clerk uh, relationship. You formed a lifelong pr a friendship with Judge Longstaff, and uh, I know it's fair to say he had a great influence on your entire legal and judicial career. Is that fair? Tell us about that. It is not an overstatement to say he completely uh, changed uh, my legal career. Uh, I went to law school uh, with the expectation that I would be uh, practicing in a small office in a county seat situation, in fact, probably Delaware County where my parents lived and they had some friends that were lawyers that were all recruiting me when I was uh, first in law school and, and um, so that's kind of the expectation that I had. Um, but then I had the opportunity to work uh, as a clerk at the federal court and uh, working both with Judge Longstaff, and I also had the opportunity in those years to do some work with Judge Stewart. And um, as a result of all of that, it, it completely changed what I wanted to do, and it completely changed what I thought maybe I could do uh, in terms of uh, the practice of law. And um, so it, it turned my, uh, my concept of what it would be to be a lawyer uh, completely upside down. Understood. And Longstaff and I are, are very close. Uh, he, uh, uh, he's uh, really a genuinely wonderful human being uh, and uh, uh, was a great judge, and uh, we have been uh, very close for a long time. We, we're family. Yeah. So uh, recognizing you weren't going to clerk for Judge Longstaff forever, <laughs> what was your uh, next move? What was your next uh, uh, career path? Well, my next move was uh, to apply to the Nymaster Law Firm, and you guys rejected me. <laughs> you knew that was going to come up, right? I knew that was going to come uh, up, and all I can say is we usually correct ourselves, which we'll talk about we did shortly after that. But go I, ahead. Uh, I, I, I still have the letter that I teased my neighbor, Craig Shives, who wrote the letter about. Um, but um, um, So I, I didn't uh, have the opportunity to stay in Des Moines, and um, so I went back to Waterloo, where I had been in broadcasting, uh, and uh, interviewed with some firms there, and, um, uh, and I, I got a kick out of one of the lawyers that I interviewed with who said, uh, go back to the law school and talk to your colleagues there and find out what they're going to get paid in their new jobs, and tell me what it is, and I'll give you $1,000 more because I want you to know that you got the most. <laughs> I didn't go to work for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I ended up with the, uh, the Mosier, Thomas, uh, Mosier Thomas law firm at that time. It's now Dutton Braun stock, I think. Um, and uh, uh, worked for them uh, for actually a relatively short period of time uh, uh, in the litigation area. The good thing about that was, you know, that was back in the day when a young trial lawyer got to be a trial lawyer. Uh, that has become 
really difficult anymore to get the opportunity to be in the courtroom. But back in those days, I think it was the Western Insurance Company they had a relationship with and a couple of others. And there were these thirty to fifty thousand dollar lawsuits that you could have the young lawyer in your office go try it. And as a result, you get trial experience in that stage that is a multiple of what you can expect to get now as a young lawyer. Um, so that was a tremendous benefit to the career, and, uh, um, and I really enjoyed working with the people there, but then decided that um, I wanted to come back to Des Moines, uh, and uh, did that in a couple of different ways. Right. <laughs> and let's go there next. Uh, you came to Des Moines, and you uh, formed your own law firm, really, with, with two other lawyers. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, as it turns out, it's probably an overstatement to say my own law firm. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I came back to Des Moines and joined a couple of law school uh, classmates, and we were going to establish the next great law firm in Des Moines. And um, then uh, uh, the other two fellows uh, decided that they wanted to advertise, and of course, that was a very different time with lawyer advertising. and. Uh, it was actually contrary to the rules of ethics uh, in Iowa at the time. Uh, but they wanted to do it, advertise on television, uh, through a fellow out of Colorado, a fellow named Norton Fricky, I remember his name, uh, who uh, sold the ads that you could use. And um, I was not comfortable with that, um, because I, I was not comfortable with lawyer advertising generally. I didn't like the whole feel of it. Uh, and um, uh, I particularly didn't like the idea of going ahead and doing it, violating the ethics, and then challenging it. I, I thought it might be better to ask for a rule change uh, as opposed to just violating it. Um, but uh, the other guys decided a different strategy was in order, and uh, so I left. I went to practice law in my dining room. And before we go to the next step, which I know much about. Um, at a later point in your private practice career, you became chief counsel for the Committee of Professional Ethics and Conduct of the Iowa State Bar Association. As, as you reflect back on being retained in that position, did that have some connection with the fact that you had declined to become a partner in a law firm which was intending to proceed with some advertising in violation of the rules at that time? Oh, I think so. Uh, um, I think that um uh, there were a couple of things that happened around that that was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, there was a Supreme Court opinion on the matter, and when the uh, advance sheet came out on that, um, uh, it referred to the law firm uh, of uh, the other two guys and me. It had my name in the in the title, and um, the president of the bar at that time uh, was Bob Van Voren, and Van Voren uh, called the Supreme Court and said, "It isn't fair for Gritzner's name to be in the name of that case." And so when it was published, they took it out. And so I, I had the attention of people in the bar because I had left the law firm over the whole matter. And, and so I think that was part of it. And then uh, at the time, uh, I think it was Tom Finley was the chairman of the Ethics Committee at the time. Uh, and um, so Tom was aware of me. So yeah, it, it, anything that happens to you in your career, people have to know who you are. <laughs> and so I think that that was part of it. They, they were aware of me and uh, as a result uh, uh, decided to contact me and see if I'd be interested in doing that. So I know you didn't stay in your dining room long. Uh, tell us about the next opportunity that came to you. Well, one of Iowa's great lawyers, Roy Voigts, actually had called me uh, when I was still in Waterloo and um, he had seen me at a defense counsel seminar. I made a presentation and he'd seen me there. And he called me because Nymaster was looking for somebody at that time. And, uh, uh, but that was at, right at the time that I had told the other two guys that I was going to come and join them in Des Moines. And uh, Roy called and asked if I'd be interested in Nymaster. And I said, well, you know, I've made this promise to these other fellows. And so I, uh, I, I really feel that I have to go through with that. Well, then when that cratered, uh, and Roy found out that I was practicing law in my dining room, but he called again. And uh, of course, at that point in time, I was uh, ready to jump. And knowing Roy, he was probably pretty direct. And 
He was very what direct. wanted with you? And I didn't tell him about the letter I had from <laughs> Craig Shimes. <laughs> so, uh, you agreed to join us at that time, I Master Good, and uh, uh, there are many things to talk about in that respect, but uh, certainly one place to start, maybe, is working with Roy, there was a particularly large opportunity that presented itself fairly early in your career. It ended up being pretty ironic that the very first thing I did, I did at the Nymaster Law Firm was read the fire marshal's report on the Yonkers fire. Uh, and um, and, and for, for people more recent, not the recent Yonkers fire, but the one before that, that was at the uh, Merle Hay Shopping Center, and uh, I think we had uh, 11 or 12 people were killed in that fire, and, and of course there was a lot of property damage, and there was some other personal injury and so on. It was a very, a very large case, uh, but I got involved with Roy, uh, in representing clients uh, in that case. Uh, of course, uh, I was... Uh, I was not representing the clients in the sense that any client hired me, but I was working with Roy on the matter. Uh, but um, given what my career ended up being, it was pretty ironic that it started with a fire marshal's report. Right. And for those who might not remember that Yonkers fire and the litigation that followed, uh, the, the multiple defendants who were sued in that case read like a who's who of the Fortune 400. Uh, there were 25 or 30 major corporations, I think, uh, that were sued in that case. And it was at a time where, among other things, there was a, a theory being pursued around the country regarding the potential off-gassing of material referred to as PVC found in wiring and cable cabling. How did you learn about PVC, whether by choice or otherwise? In that well, our clients, uh, our clients were communications uh, companies, and, um, and so they had communications cables, telephone, uh, uh, of course, all of the cash registers and all of the uh, computer equipment and so forth in the store. And the, the theory was that uh, PVC being polyvinyl chloride, that when it got hot, one of the things that would come off is hydrogen chloride gas. That is true. And then the theory was that when this hydrogen chloride gas comes off, it gets into the air and people that are in the building are completely compromised because when the hydrogen chloride gas comes in contact with moisture in their nose, their eyes, their lungs, that you just can't get out. You clamp down. You can't breathe. You can't see. Uh, and so this clamp down theory kept people from escaping from a fire. That was basically the theory. And um, uh, it turns out it's completely not true. Um, and it actually, the research that demonstrated that it was not true occurred while we were in court in Des Moines in the trial in that case. And uh, we tried very hard to get that research before the jury and the judge in the case, Judge Strickler, I'll say his name because I'm going to be kind, uh, <laughs> Judge Strickler uh, ruled that uh, we were already well into the trial, well beyond discovery, and he would not allow it to come in, which I thought was outrageous at the time, but now as a judge I understand. <laughs> Uh, but um, it turned out that the whole theory of this clampdown effect just was not true. Yes, that gas comes off, but it doesn't have these effects. And as a result, what a lot of these major companies thought was going to be the, another asbestos kind of a situation ended up just fizzling away. But at the time, it was a, a huge case with a huge a lot of attention in Des Moines by all of these companies that were kind of standing their ground on the issue here. And, and there are a couple other details of that litigation that are worth going into because I know how greatly it influenced your, your career. Um, as you mentioned, there were 25 or so odd defendants, all of whom had very good lawyers. And as I remember, certainly the top defense lawyers in the state seemed to all to be involved in that case. Oh, yes. But there came a point where the defendants needed to cut down the team for actual trial. Can you tell us about that? Well, they realized that um, two dozen lawyers couldn't try the case. Uh, and um, we had a defense group um, that worked together uh, because our interests were essentially the same. Uh, and uh, Bob Van Voren, again, um, who was chairing that group at the time, uh, was basically holding a meeting to discuss what we should do in terms of how we would try the case, how many people would be involved and what they would do and so on. I had been involved, I'd been given the assignment of focusing on firefighters, what they did, what they saw, and, and so forth. And as we got close to trial, what the firefighters did and what they saw became absolutely vital to the defense. 
And uh, so I assumed, of course, that I had put this package together. I was going to hand it off to uh, what we've referred to in those days as one of the gray hairs. Uh, I was blonde. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I put it together and had it all ready to go. And uh, we're at this meeting, and Van Boren is deciding who is going to try the case. And he started selecting the opening statement and the people that were going to do the argument and all this sort of thing. And then he came to the firefighter evidence, and he said, Gritson is going to do that. And I'm like three years out of law school at this point, and I've just been nominated to take a significant part of the trial, along with five other lawyers. I was one of the six lawyers that actually tried the case, which, full disclosure, it ended up being the most important case I ever lost. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of them can be that way. But to your credit, so, and that case did go through verdict, and uh, at the conclusion of that trial, you had gained some tremendous trial experience. A lot, of trial experience uh, a lot of trial experience uh, and, and working with some really, really fine lawyers. I mean, obviously, Voights, Voights was not in the case anymore at that point in time. I, I was actually asked to come back into the case when uh, Roy's uh, clients had settled. Uh, and then other clients in the case, because of the work that I had been doing, uh, asked me to come back in for them, which I did. Uh, and um, so uh, Roy was not there anymore, but there were you know, other just uh, amazing, uh, wonderful uh, lawyers in that case, uh, uh, well, as well as Roy. I mean, obviously Bob Van Voren, uh, uh, Dick Smith, uh, and um, uh, John Mackerman. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of people that uh, I'm reminded of who's in the room here. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of really wonderful lawyers that I learned a great deal from uh, in that case. And the other thing that was significant about that case is I came to know, and they came to know me, a bunch of in-house counsel with major corporations that have fire problems. Right. And so with that case under your belt at that point, um, there were further opportunities that turned out pretty quickly in that same area for you. The calls started coming in. Um, yeah, it, um, uh, it was really very interesting. Uh, I've often characterized the, the way that I built my practice was kind of the same way that a divorce lawyer builds their practice. It's through word of mouth. <laughs> you know, who do you use for your divorce? That kind of thing. And, uh, but the word of mouth that was going on was one in-house counsel to another. Um, you know, Corporation A calls up Corporation B and, and says, you know, hey, I got this fire or explosion uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, who do you guys use? And it, that's kind of the way it went together. And people started saying, well, there's, there's this guy in Des Moines. Um, so it, it started building uh, uh, pretty fast. In fact, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the largest uh, clients that I had over the years, uh, they found out about me by calling the general counsel of John Deere. And the guy at John Deere said, well, we, there's this guy in Des Moines. And it had, actually, uh, being in Des Moines was very helpful because I was usually cheaper than anybody they could hire <laughs> where the fire was. And uh, it, it, we'd be here all day and all night going through many of the major cases you handled in private practice while at, at, at Nine Master, and I won't do that. But there are, and I know there's at least one or more cases that have a special place in your memory that we ought to mention. One, uh, commonly referred to as the Jackson Labs fire case. Could you tell us briefly about that? The Jackson know? Laboratory is a, an amazing institution in, in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, I think they have five or six Nobel Prizes in medicine, uh, mostly having to do with genetics. Um, they do an amazing amount of research, but one of the things that they do is they raise research mice, and they are perfectly genetically matched. So if you're doing research about diabetes or something else, you can get exactly the same genetic mouse for 20 years, uh, so that your, your research is exactly the same. And that's what they do. And they have this huge building where they raise these mice. Well, the building was being refurbished. And in the process of refurbishing the building, they were using a product called Glassboard, which is made by the Chemlite Company, which was one of my clients. And uh, the theory was uh, that a, a small fire developed during construction. And uh, 
the glass board material, which is basically a plastic material with fiberglass in it, that it uh, caused the fire to become a very large fire in a short period of time. And a half million research mice died in the fire. We like to think of it as the largest wrongful death case in the history of Maine. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's, at first, everyone thought, my gosh, we've set medical research back 20 years, when in fact what happened is when they, when they put the herd back together again, they actually found more strains, and so they actually enhanced medical research, as it turned out. But, uh, but that was a, a huge fire loss that uh, I was involved in defending the company. Uh, on a fire spread theory. And that went through trial, uh, as I recall, three weeks, a month? We tried uh, that case, I, I think we were about six weeks. Um, we tried that case in uh, Bangor, Maine, uh, and um, uh, before a Maine jury, and as a defense lawyer, give me a Maine jury every time, <laughs> because they pretty much figure if something bad happened to you, you probably had a lot to do with it yourself. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they, they were terrific. Uh, but, but we were we were successful. We got a defense verdict and uh, uh, a very pleased client. I, I I'll tell you, uh, during the time we were in that trial, the local media was covering it a great deal because the Jackson Laboratory is a, a big deal in that area. And um, well, there was a particularly dull period during the trial, and so the local reporter was talking to the lawyers, and she said, "Well, um, uh, what's it um, what's it costing your client to defend this case?" I said, "Well, I'm not going to tell you that. That's private information. Well, what's your hourly rate?" I said, well, I'm not going to tell you that. And I, I said, "I'm a I'm a bargain at any price." Well, she put it in the paper. And when I called the client to let them know that we had a defense verdict, their response was, turns out you are a bargain at any price. <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned that anecdote, otherwise I was going to have to bring it up, because those of us who know you well, and, and know you, how truly modest you are, uh, I remember when you told me about that quote, I was surprised that you gave that quote, I know you did it tongue in cheek, and, and to a reporter who, who probably gave you no hint that that was going to be in the next day's paper, which it was. Exactly. So uh, so after Jackson Labs, uh, you had several other large fire cases. Uh, one thing I'd like to raise, because <clears throat> I was your partner at the time, I know one of your uh, strategies for every case is you were always anxious to have your clients notify you of any major fire you were likely to get involved in as soon as possible because of your your knowledge of experts and the importance of getting experts and yourself on the scene of a fire as soon as you can. Uh, there's one particular phone call I seem to remember you telling me about in that regard. You know what I'm talking about? I, I, I think I do. Uh, well, the problem, of course, as a defense lawyer is uh, uh, the plaintiff's lawyers come in and they get the evidence they like and bulldoze the scene and then two years later you get a lawsuit and there's, uh, there's no evidence to go look at. You don't have the opportunity to really investigate the fire yourself. And so I was routinely telling my clients, you know, don't be shy, they're going to find you. Don't think you can hide by being quiet. Uh, you know, let us know when you've got a fire, you know there's a fire. Let us know so we can get in there, we can make a proper investigation and protect ourselves. And uh, so I was constantly telling the clients, uh, you, you've got to get to us early as possible. Well. There was a huge warehouse fire uh, in Phoenix. The fire was so bad that the smoke closed the Sky Harbor Airport. Uh, and uh, uh, I got this uh, call from the client in New York, and he said, Jim, uh, the fire is still burning. Is this soon enough? <laughs> <laughs> and you or your experts were on a plane to Phoenix, as we I were, recall. We were there very quick. And hours. we were investigating a fire scene in Phoenix in August. It was warm. <laughs> and <clears throat> to, I think to accurately summarize this segment of your career, my recollection in talking with you is uh, over the roughly 20 years you spent with Nine Master Good, um, you were involved in fire cases in 25 different states. 25, right? Yeah, 25 different states. Uh, not all of them ended up being lawsuits because some of them we were able to resolve without uh, a lawsuit, either discouraging a lawsuit or finding a way to resolve it very quickly. But uh, yeah, we had, we had fires in 25 states. And it, it ended up, uh, it branched out some because I, I got involved with a, an excess insurance company 
that would bring me in, you know, people that are insuring the $5 million to $20 million level, that sort of thing, which is a great client to have. Um, but um, uh, when I got doing that kind of work, I branched out. I was doing a lot of work with plastics fires where having to do with the uh, smoke, the off gases and so forth, and the fire spread. And, and uh, when I got into that, then we got into a lot of fire uh, explosion cases involving gas. Uh, and uh, so we, we started seeing a, a, a lot of cases around the country that were different than what we've been doing. And before we <coughs> close the summary of your career at Nine Master, I think it's worth mentioning it, as busy as you were with your fire products liability practice, you were for several years <coughs> serving as chief counsel to the Ethics Commission, as I mentioned earlier. Tell us just a little bit about that and how that worked into your career and how that may have had some effect on your uh, your views of things when you became a judge? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I think it did. I, I hadn't really thought about it until you asked that question, but it's, it's an interesting point. Um, uh, I was um, uh, counsel for the uh, Committee on Professional Ethics uh, for a, a period of time in which we, we prosecuted over a hundred cases. Uh, and um, uh, it was an interesting thing to do. Uh, the vast majority of the people that we dealt with, we were the last person at a long line of bad things that had happened to them. Um, we did not prosecute a lot of criminals, a lot of crooks, a lot of bad people. We prosecuted a lot of broken people that happened to be lawyers. Uh, and going through that process gave me the feeling that, you know, we don't have to treat these people badly. We can treat these people with respect. We'll do what we have to do in terms of their ability to practice law, but we don't have to beat them up. We don't have to be rude to them. Uh, and as a result, I think I had a decent relationship with almost everyone that I prosecuted. There were a few that probably were bad people or bad lawyers, but generally they were just people that were having a lot of bad things happen in their lives. That's still true with what I do today. I still deal with a lot of people that just have bad things and bad pasts and things that happen in their lives that cause them to make unfortunate decisions. They're not horrible people. Uh, they've done some unfortunate things. Um, but as a result, as a judge, I try to treat people the same way. Um, I have One of my law clerks gave me a little plaque that sits over there on the side. It's a, a German poet named von Goethe um, who uh, wrote, uh, treat people as though they were what they ought to be and you help them become what they're possible of being. I probably fail at that sometimes, but I try to do that all the time. And that experience prosecuting lawyers, I think, really laid the groundwork for the way I deal with people uh, that are in unfortunate circumstances as a judge. Now, having said that, there are occasionally cases that are so bad that it's difficult to treat them that way. I, in a child pornography, pornography case a few years ago, I told a guy over in Davenport, I'm going to send you to prison for 30 years. And the reason I'm going to send you for 30 years is the United States Congress wouldn't give me any more. So there are times when you cannot find a way to be kind to someone who has not been kind themselves. But I, I, I tried to do that with lawyers, and I think I did. I, I think that um, we did not leave much of a wake of people that felt that we treated them unfairly. And so with that summary of your private practice uh, career, uh, as abbreviated as we've made it, frankly, <laughs> but in about late 2000, early 2001, uh, I guess you became aware of the possibility of an opportunity to become a United States District Judge. Can you tell us how that came about? Yeah. Um, Senator Grassley, of course, was in a position on judiciary and, and uh, because of his seniority, and um, he was in a position to have something to do with that. And uh, uh, I had known uh, uh, Chuck Grassley for many years. I met him when I was in the news business. and. Uh, and we got to be personal friends uh, over the years. And as time went by, um, there were times when I was involved uh, with his campaign. And in fact, I chaired uh, three or four of them, uh, as I look back now. Uh, and um, so we, we knew each other very well. 
And Senator Grassley had a fellow named Wythe Willie, a, a, a lawyer from Iowa that um, worked with him, and he kind of became uh, uh, Senator Grassley's judge picker. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting at home one night, and the phone rings, I answer the phone, and it's Wythe Willie. Wythe says, the boss wants to know if you're interested in being a federal judge. Well, lightning just struck. <laughs> it struck. Um, you know, becoming a federal judge is not something you plan for because there are too many things that have to fall together. In my case, the United States Supreme Court had to decide an election. Uh, but, uh, uh, but Wythe called and said, you know, are you interested? Would you be willing to apply? And uh, I told him, like I told Longstaff about talking to my wife, so I got to talk to my wife. And of course, I had to talk to Longstaff too. Uh, and, uh, but that's how it started. And so I, I did apply and uh, got into the process. At that time, there were a couple of positions open. Both the Eighth Circuit and the District Court were open at the same time. Uh, and uh, uh, Senator Grassley had asked me to serve on his uh, nominations committee. Well, once I was a candidate for the District Court, I couldn't be on that. But uh, I did serve on his uh, uh, committee for the Eighth Circuit position uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, so I would... <laughs> I would be in the room <laughs> when they were talking about the Eighth Circuit, and I would leave the room when they would talk about the district court. As you look back at that phone call, Your Honor, uh, do you recall what was your own personal uh, choice and interest before talking with Zoe that, yes, this is something I'm pretty sure I want to do, or did you pause? I don't know that I've ever met someone who served as a federal law clerk who didn't have in the back of their minds that that would be something that would be worthy of considering. Um, because it's, it's just an experience because of the nature of the lawyers in federal court, the nature of the work that you do in federal court, the support that you have in federal court, all of those things. Uh, it's kind of always in the back of your mind that if that opportunity were to surface, uh, that, that would be a wonderful opportunity. So in that sense, yes. Um, but. Uh, you, you, as I said, you, you really can't plan for it because too many things have to happen that have nothing to do with you. And so you can, uh, you can basically take the Vince Lombardi position, be in a position to win. Now there are a lot of people uh, that can, can well understand your interest in that possibility given that stage. There are those of us who are your partners <laughs> who thought we should maybe give you a sanity test. <laughs> but we were biased. Just tell us about, you know, your thought process at the time. You're, you're at the pinnacle of a very successful trial career, national trial reputation. Uh, what influenced you to say, no, I'm ready to move to this next stage? And, and I'd be interested to know Zoe's reaction if you could share that with us. Sure. Um, her reaction has changed over the years. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, it was, it was very interesting because I was at a point in my, uh, my legal career where I was very content. Uh, things were going very well. I had a great client base. Um, I was in a terrific firm that I was very comfortable with, uh, and um, the firm had given me the opportunity, you know, a base from which to do what I wanted to do. And, and um, so um, it, it was uh, kind of at the top of, of where I wanted to be as a lawyer, and um, that was difficult to walk away from. Um, I would say that the considerations, well, first of all, it's timing. I mean, obviously the opportunities don't come up all the time. You you either do it or you don't do it at that point in time or it's gone and it never happens again. Um, so that was a lot to do with it, but uh, Zoe and I talked about it. Um, you know, I said, Zoe, I got some good news and some bad news. The, the good news is I've got an opportunity here to be home more. <laughs> The bad news is I'm going to take a huge pay cut. <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> you can imagine her initial yeah. reaction uh, to that. Uh, she's a good bookkeeper. Uh, but, uh, um, but she was, again, uh, very supportive. You know, is this something that's important to you? Is it something you want to do? Uh, and, um, you know, all of that was true. And, and the time, the opportunity was there at that time. Would I have liked to have done it maybe a little bit later? Uh, yes. Um, but I was, uh, you know, around 50 at the time, and, uh, and I, I realized that traveling around the country constantly and the hours that I was keeping, when I got to be 60, that would be hard to do. 
uh, so you uh, you recognize some of the frailties of humanity, and, uh, uh, and so that was part of it too. But I think it has always been about the kind of lawyer I wanted to be, and that's part of what made being the ethics counsel important to me, it's, uh, and it's part of what made being a judge important to me. Is, is it, I wanted to be a good lawyer, and uh, it wasn't about money, because money comes if you're a good lawyer, um, but uh, so it was. It was part of that. It was just an opportunity to, to do uh, something that I thought was a terrific thing to do, and you just don't say no. I, I, I think it was. I, I talked to some good friends. You, of course, were one of them. Uh, Tom Zurich was another. And of course, Zurich's the quote was, uh, "Yeah, do it because you can." <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I know everyone, every person who's been. Uh, nominated to be a federal judge has some uh, specific story about how you were informed you were a selection. Um, I know in your case, I found your, the way you learned about it to be particularly interesting. Uh, I mean, for those of us who have never been called by the President of the United States, could you just tell us about how you learned you were the nomination? Actually, it was very nice because we were at a judicial conference in Kansas City. Uh, no, no, St. Louis, excuse me. We were in St. Louis at a judicial conference, and Longstaff was there. And um, uh, this call came in on my cell phone, and Longstaff was standing beside me. And, of course, Longstaff had been appointed a federal judge by George H.W. Bush. Uh, and um, I answered the phone, and this woman says, uh, this is Ashley in uh, President Bush's office, and he wonders if you have time to talk to him right now. And I said, actually, does anybody ever say no? And she said, you could be the first. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but obviously, she, she put me through to uh, President Bush, and he was, uh, he was delightful. He was very nice in uh, thanking me for you know, making the personal sacrifices to do the public service and that sort of thing, and, and uh, uh, wishing me well and, and that sort of thing. But it was, a, it was a very nice call. Not all presidents do that. Um, it's a nice gesture. Uh, particularly when you're talking about the numbers of people that they ne necessarily have to make those calls if they start making them at all. Um, and of course, it was also ironic because uh, uh, Ashley, who placed the call, uh, is the wife of Justice Kavanaugh. <laughs> so she became famous for other reasons. <laughs> uh, and as I said in the outset summary, you were confirmed by the Senate then in February of 2002. On Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> A voice vote, by the way, which I, I take to be unanimous. That's uh, my next question. My understanding it was a voice vote, which is yes. pretty unheard of anymore and certainly impressive at the time. Judge uh, Dick Leon uh, in Washington, D.C. and I uh, became good friends in that entire process, and we were both confirmed on a, a voice vote that night. So for a number of years, we don't do it anymore, but for a number of years we called each other to wish each other happy Valentine's Day. Appropriately. Uh, before I move on and talk about your career on the bench, uh, I, I have a couple of follow-up questions to the closure of your private practice career. Do you miss it? Not now, um, but I did for a long time. Um, I, I really enjoyed the practice very much. I worked pretty hard, but it was a, it was a very enjoyable practice. I mean, gosh, it even involved fire trucks. You know? it, was, it was an enjoyable practice, and I enjoyed working with the scientific people that I was working with. It was fascinating work, um, and, um, and worked with a lot of great lawyers around the country, so everything about that was very challenging. Um, and there are a lot of things, of course, in the practice of law that are scorecards, you know, money, great law firm, great clients, you know, things like that, winning cases. Well, there's nothing like that on the bench. Now, there are a lot of other good things about being on the bench, uh, but most of that you can adjust to. Um, I think that the thing that was most difficult for me uh, for a significant period of time was what you lose in that phone call that comes in, hi, we're XYZ Corporation, we are in a lot of trouble, and we need your help. The professional rush that comes from that is something you can't get on the bench. And I missed that for a long time. Um, but um, senior judge is not a bad gig. 
uh, and um, uh, so when you get to that point and you, you have the ability to work at the pace you want to work and with the support that you have and so forth, uh, you look at it differently. And, and uh, you know, the, the travel and, and the work and so forth uh, around the country would have been very difficult to do as, as I got into my older years. Uh, as you entered into your judicial career and you began your service on the bench, what did you find to be the biggest adjustments that you found yourself having to make uh, as you began your, the career with your robe on rather than being in the trial trenches? Well, uh, I was concerned uh, about adjusting to um, working in the criminal law area because I had not done that uh, uh, other than I did prosecute a guy once for letting his goat run free in LaPorte City, Iowa. Uh, I got him, by the way. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I had no experience in the criminal law, and uh, I was in baby judges school with a mentor judge uh, was talking to me about what my reservations were, and I said, well, my reservation is uh, the criminal law. And she said, well, what did you do in your practice? I said, well, I did product liability cases and large fires and explosions. And, and she said, if you can do a product liability case, don't worry about it. The criminal law is going to be fine. And, and of course, what she meant was not to necessarily diminish the importance of, of criminal law, but rather the idea that in the criminal side, everything is pretty repetitive. There are some differences from time to time, but a lot of things you're going to see over and over again. And so there's a, a security in that. Uh, but I think uh, uh, when I was thinking about taking the nomination, uh, I had lunch with Longstaff, and I said to him, uh, you know, what do you do in those areas of the law that you've never done before? And Longstaff said, that's what law clerks are for. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, that's true. But one of the things that, that I think is a challenge as a judge is the broad range. You know, they refer to us as courts of limited jurisdiction, and I don't know where that limit is because it's pretty broad. Um, you know, there are 4,000 uh, uh, federal crimes. Uh, and uh, um, so you get involved in so many different things that are very new to you. And uh, you have to gain a flexibility that you didn't have to have in private practice because my focus was so narrow. Uh, and um, uh, that's a challenge to, to get used to and get comfortable with. Um, one question regarding your adjustment to criminal law and now being a judge. Uh, how did you learn to adjust to and handle criminal, criminal sentencing? I don't think I have, uh, in, in the sense that uh, that is far and away the hardest thing I do. And it is the hardest thing I do because even though you can come off the bench knowing that you just did precisely what the facts and the law required you to do, you can still feel bad about it. And it's because these are people that are quite frequently broken people and uh, who are in a terribly difficult situation. Uh, sometimes with families uh, who are completely innocent and they're broken too. Everybody I send to prison, I send their families to prison too in a very serious way. Uh, and um, so th that is very, very difficult. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, Richard Arnold, uh, Judge Arnold and I were on a program together, and as we were going up to the stage, uh, Richard said to me, um, have you uh, adopted a sentencing philosophy? And I said, no, Richard, I sure haven't. And he said, well, neither have I. I was looking for ideas. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but if I have a sentencing philosophy, it is, it is just to... Uh, the same philosophy I had in private practice, and that is preparation is everything. Know everything you possibly can about the circumstances of this case and the circumstances of this defendant. Then recognize that you've got responsibilities that work in their favor and some responsibilities that work against them. And do your best to be as fair as you possibly can to both them and to the public that they're threatening. And uh, uh, that's, that's about the best you can do. I think it was... Roy Stevenson, who always said, uh, nobody's good enough to be a federal judge. You just do the best you can. <laughs> and so that's what I try to do, is just try to do the best I can on every case and realize that uh, 
uh, it's a pretty important thing that you're doing. And, and that's why I don't get rough with people. You know, they used to joke in the courthouse that when William C. Hansen sentenced somebody, it was, it was easier to do the time than it was to get scolded by Judge Hansen. Um, I don't do that. Um, because I'm, I'm going to put these people in federal prison for a significant period of time, and there's no reason to be mean to them in the process. So um, um, treat people as they were what they ought to be. Given that um, recitation of your views of sentencing, and just before that having commented on Judge Longstaff's remark that that's what law clerks are for, um, probably makes this a good time in my discussion with you to talk about your law clerks. And I know um, it seems like every judge has good law clerks, develops good relationships for the most part with their law clerks, and those become long-term friendships. Um, I will tell you that in preparing for this, I received a fair amount of input from your former law clerks. And um, it was impressive. Thank you for adding that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as you know, I mean, your core of law clerks presented you with a book at the uh, ceremony uh, honoring your portrait unveiling, um, which I read some of. Um, I've seen some other anecdotes that I've elicited from your law clerks. Um, how, did, how did you go about developing those kinds of relationships with your law clerks? Many of whom are, all of whom are extremely talented uh, and have gone on to be successful already. They are, and they've, they've done very well. Um, uh, I have, um, if I'm any good at this job, it's because I really hire law clerks well. Uh, I, uh, I have had fabulous law clerks. Uh, uh, they are, of course, scary smart. They're all smarter than I am. There's no reason to hire anybody else. Um, gifted writers, uh, but in, on top of that, good judgment and genuinely wonderful people. And they've become like family. Um, we have, uh, for a number of years, uh, every December we have a holiday party. These kids come back, kids, <laughs> come back from all over the country uh, to come to that party and, and to uh, uh, see each other and to see Zoe and I. And, and um, so we are very much like family. But. Uh, they have been absolutely wonderful, and uh, uh, every one of them, although I, I have to single out, uh, uh, I have a career law clerk, uh, Cheryl Murad, who's been with me really since the beginning, except for a two-year period when she uh, went over and uh, clerked for uh, Judge uh, Bill Riley on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and then she came back as my career clerk. And uh, I often say the most important thing a law professor ever said to me is when David Walker called me and said, you've got to meet Cheryl Murad, <laughs> because it's been a gift uh, all these years, but we have continued to uh, to recruit uh, largely from Drake and Iowa, but, uh, but from all over the country now. I think we've got law clerks from 13, 14 different law schools at this point, um, and they have all been absolutely wonderful people that we absolutely adore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, last year and again this year, the pandemic has made it impossible for us to get together. Uh, and I think we're probably going to decide that they're all getting busy enough now that we ought to let them go and uh, not ask them yeah. to come back every year. But uh, um, we uh, will try to see them, although not all together. <clears throat> um, again, we could probably spend an extensive afternoon talking about the many cases that you've presided over while a judge, but I'm sure there are uh, a few that have a particular uh, aspect to them or uh, have uh, uh, generated a particular uh, memory for you or an interest uh, uh, as you reflect back on that particular case. Are there a couple of cases that maybe we can talk about that stand out in your mind as significant or special for a particular reason? Sure. Um, of course, there are some cases that stand out in your mind for very bad reasons. We won't, we I didn't won't, ask about those. We won't talk about those. Uh, I often tell my law clerks, you know, you're going to learn a lot from watching lawyers that do things well, but you're going to learn more from watching lawyers that do things badly, uh, and you'll realize why it's bad. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, there, there are some cases that certainly stand out. One of, one of the remarkable cases, one of the first cases, well, might have been the first case I ever tried as a federal judge, uh, was a huge case involving a Bandag in Iowa, but uh, uh, tire companies throughout the world. Uh, it was a, a gigantic case that uh, Judge Woolley had left on my plate, which I loved because I wanted to try cases. Um, but it was memorable because this was a courtroom full of absolutely the finest lawyers you could ever expect to see. I mean, they were, they were wonderful. They tried a wonderful case. And um, they, uh, at that time, were uh, at the cutting edge of courtroom technology. We didn't have all of the things, the bells and whistles that we have now. And uh, they had set up a huge screen in the, our large courtroom here, looked like a drive-in theater. And they were projecting things on that, where they had recorded the depositions and that sort of thing. But um, Don Scott, particularly from Denver, uh, who was the plaintiff's attorney, who uh, sadly later died in a plane crash, but Don would take his computer, his laptop, to the podium. And while he was examining a witness, he would run the tech himself uh, without a glitch. And it was one of those things where he could say to the witness, uh, uh, well, is this true or false? And the witness would say, well, that's false. And then he would in his computer and up on the screen would come the witness in their deposition say it was true. Uh, it was just an amazing feat of uh, litigation uh, work that um, really impressed me from the very beginning and impressed me very much on the power of high tech in the courtroom. You know, you communicate with jurors a lot of ways, and uh, uh, but when you've got the gift of being able to be a good lawyer on your feet, but at the same time, you can utilize that kind of technology. Not everybody's going to be able to do it themselves from the podium, but um, but that case uh, sadly settled settled after about three weeks of trial. Uh, I was very disappointed when all of the uh, presidents of these companies came to the Des Moines airport and cut a deal while I was trying the case. I would love to have seen a verdict in that case, but that one certainly stands out in my mind. Um, one that um, was particularly fascinating ha involved Kemen Foods uh, here. It was a fight with a Mexican company uh, over patent. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting case for many reasons um, because of the unusual nature of the way these companies in Mexico operate uh, with no documentation, at least none that they would ever tell us they had. And, uh, and uh, so it was a very unusual trial in that sense. But it was also unusual because there's a quirk in the patent law that if someone does not behave well during discovery, you can flip the burden of proof on them. And so that case involved a burden of proof both for the plaintiff and for the defendant. And the jury in this extremely complicated patent case decided if you had the burden of proof, you lost. <laughs> So I thought that was fascinating, both in terms of jury dynamics and also in terms of the way the, uh, the case went on. Uh, another thing that w really stands out in my mind uh, is uh, a case involving a bulldozer accident down in Georgia. They got it up here because Georgia had a very strict statute of repose and Iowa's was a little more liberal and so they brought the case up here. And I won't bore you with the details about the case, but it was a case that impressed upon me the human nature of what we do. This case ended up with a defense verdict for the bulldozer company. And as we were all leaving the courthouse, this fellow who'd been the operator who was very seriously injured in this case, was walking across the street from the courthouse over to the hotel, hobbling along with his crutches, barely able to walk in pouring rain after having lost what he thought was going to be his rescue lawsuit. And the humanity of that has had an effect on me that has lasted a very long time. Uh, so there, there are things like that. And there are other things that stand out to the Anderum case, which was a, you don't get a lot of child custody cases in federal court, but this one involved a child custody of a, of a child from Sweden. And it was a unique case because we now have the ability to actually have a witness testifying uh, from someplace like Sweden uh, in the courtroom, on the camera, on the, on the video, as though they're right there in the courtroom. It was amazing yeah, how effective that was. Um, so there are things like that that stand out. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, cases that, that are significant on the criminal side are uh, 
uh, probably more ugly than this occasion requires, uh, because the crimes themselves were particularly ugly. One additional civil case, if you don't mind me raising and asking you about, uh, and the reason I do is whether you know it or not, I hope you know it, I think certainly in, in Iowa, you have a reputation as being a trial lawyer's judge. In, in other words, I think trial lawyers appreciate the fact that you used to try cases, you know what's involved, how the lawyers have to deal with pressures and so forth. And uh, uh, I think for the most part, th that's been uh, one thing that, that holds you in great stead with the trial bar. I did have some familiarity with a recent oh, case oh. you tried, uh, where it was the battle between a bottling company and PepsiCo, its franchisor, I guess, where you can take it from here. Uh, I understand that trial was contentious would be a very mild word. It's a tough and, business. And, and what <laughs> caught my eye is I read the Eighth Circuit's opinion that arose out of that trial and in the portion of their opinion which upheld the verdict and your instructions, they said in part that uh, after talking about the contentiousness of the trial, they said neither party was receptive to the efforts of an experienced, competent, and capable trial judge to lower the heat. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you read that as well. What, what do you recall about that trial in that regard? And was you know, that something that you were used to dealing with and lowering the heat, so to speak, in a contentious trial, or was this particularly uh, outside the boundaries? Well, I have to tell you that uh, Judge Kornman up in South Dakota uh, sent me an email with uh, that sheet from the uh, opinion from the Eighth Circuit, and he circled that line with a note, is this, is this you? <laughs> but, uh, and uh, and I, when, he, when he said uh, both capable and competent, I thought one of those must have been referring to being lucid. Um, but, uh, well, yes, um, one of the problems for litigators is doing your best work being absolutely loyal to your client, but at the same time not getting infected with the venom that the clients may have for one another. Um, the pop business is a very tough business. Um, uh, I know from years ago in the practice uh, with a different bottler, I won't mention, uh, knowing that it's a very, very tough business. And it's even a tough business between the people that are working together. Uh, and uh, so um, th there was a there's a lot of heat in that lawsuit, and I think that the Eighth Circuit opinion, he was trying to make a point, um, and I think I might have been the beneficiary of, uh, of making the point with that line. Uh, but, um, uh, and he kind of suggested that some of that venom in that case might have been the lawyers. I, I think it probably was as much the parties than, as the lawyers. Um, and, but that, that's a thing, there's a lesson in that, uh, because that's a thing that trial lawyers really need to be careful about. Uh, there's no reason for lawyers to hate each other. Um, you know, when we were doing that Jackson Lab case, these were tough lawyers. I worked with them several times. They're out of Minneapolis, Jim Vetterly and Gary Gordon, superb lawyers. And we litigated against you there, other repeatedly. We would fight all day, tooth and nail, and then go dinner together. And there's no reason that that can't be the way the profession operates. Um, but uh, uh, but it, it was it was tense uh, in this particular case. I, I, looking back at it, I'm not sure what it was I did that it was lowering the temperature, uh, except to ask them to lower it. Uh, other than specific cases, I want to jump ahead. Uh, another aspect of your uh, judicial career has been, particularly since you've gone of senior status, but before that even, You've been named to a number of committees of the judiciary that have some importance. Uh, tell us about those. Well, I was originally uh, named uh, to the, uh, uh, the Committee uh, on Judicial Conduct and Disability uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the federal courts uh, in the country. And, and that is a committee that basically functions as the ultimate appellate court uh, when judges get into trouble. Judges that get into trouble are usually prosecuted within their individual circuits. Uh, and then once that is completed, then there's an opportunity for appeal uh, to the uh, Judicial Conduct Committee. And um, so that committee then sits as an appellate court in those proceedings. 
and it's a unique experience because it was quite a, a pleasure and a thrill for me because the people that I worked with on that committee were just sensational judges, wonderful uh, people from across the country, excellent judges and excellent people, and yet we were dealing with judges that had behaved very badly. You know, frequently cases that you look at and you think, you know, how in the world did that happen? Uh, you got somebody that's vetted, you know, a federal judge, uh, and yet uh, people end up being human, even at that, and um, they do unfortunate things. But um, so that was a, a fascinating process of working with that committee and working through that process. And we recommended impeachment on a couple of occasions. Um, on most occasions, when we had a really bad case, uh, by the time uh, we were done with our work, um, the, the judge involved would resign. So uh, there would not be an impeachment proceeding. But, uh, but that's what I did with uh, that committee. I was on that committee for two uh, three-year terms. Uh, and then uh, you, uh, uh, you expire your term and, and uh, can no longer serve on the committee, except that I have been invited back uh, twice, uh, I think, by the Chief Justice when they had a conflict and somebody on the committee couldn't serve because it was something out of their circuit. Uh, and I've come back and, and served on the committee uh, on those cases. Um, and then after I finished with that, uh, then the Chief Justice uh, appointed me to the Committee on the Judicial Branch. The Committee on the Judicial Branch is a committee that is the liaison between the judici federal judiciary and the United States Congress. Uh, and uh, we deal with political issues involving the uh, judiciary and so forth. And, uh, and then the Committee on the Judicial Branch decided that they had quite an interest in what was going on with the Judicial Conduct Committee. And so they asked if they could place a liaison uh, with that committee. And um, somebody very quickly said, well, Gritzner's going to be that liaison. <laughs> and uh, so now I, I serve on the Judicial Branch Committee and that has an open term. You, you serve as long as you're, they think you're of value, I guess. Um, and then, uh, but I serve then also as a liaison to the branch, uh, to the conduct committee as well. So I do both of those now. The, the branch committee, in all fairness, uh, uh, is a contacts uh, committee. Uh, when, I, uh, when I went to my first meeting, uh, Judge D. Benson from uh, Utah looked up and he said, uh, you're new, who is it you know? <laughs> and I said, uh, Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley. Brown said, oh, that'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and to be, you're continuing that committee work today. I am. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, as a senior judge, that's kind of the thing that keeps the juices going. It's very interesting. Uh, and they're fascinating people. They're, they're, um, uh, all of them have got some kind of background uh, uh, politically uh, uh, because of course they have to have relationships with Congress and the ability to understand what's going on in Congress and and uh, uh, so uh, uh, there, there are a lot of fascinating people um, that uh, some of them are people that actually worked for uh, uh, you know this judge from Utah of course worked for Orrin Hatch and uh, our chairman uh, Rod Sippel uh, uh, worked for uh, Dick Gephardt uh, and uh, so there are a lot of connections of that sort. I never actually was on the payroll with anybody like that. Uh, I want to ask some broader concluding questions about your judiciary career. Um, I think the word judicial philosophy maybe is overused and misunderstood in many cases, but I'm still going to ask it. <laughs> uh, do you believe you have a judicial philosophy? And if so, you would be the proper person to define what that is. It is hard to define um, because um, uh, I believe quite strongly that there will be times when you will be externally viewed very differently. Um, I think that generally I would be viewed as conservative, uh, having a conservative judicial philosophy, but I'm also the judge that let him use uh, marijuana t-shirts up at Iowa State University, and I'm the judge that struck down uh, uh, statutes uh, in Iowa that people would regard uh, uh, that approach as being liberal. I think you, you look conservative on some cases, liberal on other cases, and if that's true, maybe you're doing okay. Um, but in terms of my philosophy as a judge, it really is just a matter of treating people in a way that leaves them feeling that they were treated fairly, that they were treated competently. Uh, even if they lost, they at least have been told why they lost uh, in a way that's rational 
Um, so uh, my philosophy is uh, work as hard as you can stand, be as prepared as you can possibly be, and then be kind to people in the courtroom, uh, and, um, and ultimately make sure that you do everything you can to be right, knowing full well that I'm a human being and from time to time I'm going to be wrong, not necessarily when the Eighth Circuit thinks I'm wrong, but, but from time to time I may be wrong, but, uh, but do everything you can to make sure that, um, that you have done all you can to make people feel they were treated fairly. And uh, as you continue to hear cases uh, as, as a senior status judge, but in looking forward to your eventual retirement, uh, do you see anything in particular in trends in federal litigation that give you concern? Oh, yes. Um, the biggest concern is uh, uh, the uh, diminishing jury trial. Um, a number of years ago uh, now, I, I spoke to the International um, the ADR Convention out of Drake Law School, and, and uh, in fact, that my speech ended up being a law review uh, piece. Um, but um, uh, basically, uh, talking to them about the fact that they, they need to be more honest about what they do. Uh, they don't tell the truth about juries. Uh, they suggest that juries will not treat them fairly. Uh, and. Uh, uh, they use anecdotes uh, of, uh, you know, coffee in the lap at McDonald's and things like that to suggest that juries will not treat them fairly. That has not been my experience. My experience is that juries come back within an area of reasonableness. Uh, there will be some disagreement as to what that is, but, but, but within an area of reasonableness, they will come back and be fair. And the other thing that, that you lose in that process is there are times when one side is supposed to win everything, whether it's the plaintiff or the defendant. That's justice. That doesn't happen in mediation, and it doesn't really happen very often in arbitration, because in mediation especially, that's just a question of what one side's willing to accept and the other side's willing to pay. Nobody wins everything in mediation, but, and as a result, you miss an opportunity for justice. Um, that's the first thing. I, I feel bad about the fact that we're losing the jury trial and we're losing the experience of being a, a juror, uh, particularly in federal court, which I think most jurors find to be a very interesting uh, enterprise. And the other thing is we are certainly losing really capable trial lawyers. We are beginning to see uh, in federal court where we see a lot of high profile lawyers, lawyers with big law firms with great credentials from law school, but they don't have the ability to sell the soap to a jury. Um, they're really uh, out of water when it comes to actually trying a lawsuit. Uh, and, and they don't do it well. Uh, and they do it expensively, but not well. Um, so we are losing a lot of our opportunity to train young lawyers who then become the seasoned lawyers uh, who can uh, adequately represent, represent someone in the courtroom. As a judge, I can't be somebody's lawyer. Um, but there is a significant inherent tension uh, involved uh, when you're sitting on the bench and you realize that something is not being done properly. Now, let me add that as a judge, there are always things you don't know about a case. There are always things you don't know about a client. There are always things you don't know about the pressure that the lawyer is facing. And that's one of the reasons that I'm more tolerant than lawyers than maybe sometime I might be, uh, because I recognize all of those things are true. But um, uh, I'm very concerned about what's happening to the trial lawyer practice. It's now a litigation practice, which is focused on discovery. I do want to, uh, and I appreciate and expect your response on how you, of course, can't help one side or the other. You're the judge. You've got to resist the temptation to put your trial or hat back on. I had report from one or two of your law clerks. They have heard you rule in response to an objection that that objection is overruled. <laughs> uh, is, is that fair? <laughs> yes, I do that. Uh, <laughs> and some lawyers pick up on it, uh, but not all, although I've, I've had a couple of occasions when I had uh, former law clerks who were sitting second chair to a lawyer, and uh, when I would say, that objection is overruled, that my former law clerk is immediately <laughs> going like this. 
Uh, Your Honor, let me uh, somewhat close with a, a similar overbroad question uh, as to another term that's overused and often undefined, and that's legacy. Um, if you were to describe what you would want your legacy to be, how would you describe it? It's an unfair question, but it's uh, well um, appropriate. I'm feeling pretty good uh, to, <laughs> to talk about legacy, but uh, you know, I I, I think uh, I would hope uh, that most judges might feel this way because that's what I would want judges to feel, uh, and that is. Uh, I would hope that my legacy would be that I did the homework, I was prepared, and I worked very hard to do the very best I could to both get the right result and in the process treat everybody, the parties and the lawyers, as fairly as I possibly could. Um, if, if people would say that about me, I'd be very content. Um, that uh, concludes my questions, although you are the judge, you get the last word. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered or uh, talked about that you think you would like to add to this interview? Well, given the fact that I didn't want to talk about any of it, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs>